text working group. This is not your flight. So <laughs> uh, there's a sheet there with a QR code on it. It's also outside the door. Uh, could you make sure all of you have scanned it, please? Um, either outside or here. Um, it's a equivalent. I, <laughs> if anyone could do it, me Teco could. <laughs> Just uh, someone pointed out to me that you know we never give a plug to me Teco in this stuff. If you think how this whole thing runs, and I don't have to touch the keyboard and stuff, just works. Um, you know, thank me Teco folks. They often wear me Teco shirts. And if you want this in your meetings, you know who to ask. <laughs> yes, it's uh, on, on Tuesday. I said complaint and I'm finding it was, damn it, if this was me, that could work. <laughs> was, well, I, I ran meetings long before this, and we would switch laptops, and there'd be incompatibilities between everything. We'd waste 10 minutes of every meeting messing with something, you know? So, anyway. <laughs> I mean, they, they reorient the, the cameras manually, so they, they have their layers somewhere where they must have like 50 screens. Yeah, well, that you got to think, thank, thank the knock for. <laughs> So anyway, let's um let's get the meeting started. Um, I have slides up. That's working. We've got transcription working. Um, we've got video working for our um, remote participation. Um, so I think we're good. Uh, uh, as always in an IETF meeting, everything we say here is covered by the note well. Um, the oversimplification of it is anything you say here is a contribution in the IETF and covered by uh, various RFCs that you see there. We like to live our code of conduct. Um, this is respect and courtesy to people at all times. Um, try to be impersonal. You know, you're talking about a draft, not a person. Um, we look for solutions that meet everyone's needs and, um, we try to all contribute to the work of the group. So uh, meeting details, I'm Margaret, that's Valerie on the screen. Uh, and we are the chairs of the working group. Uh, Paul is not here and uh, he might come by, he might not, depends what else he has going on. Um, he's our responsible AD. Uh, you can see all the um, URLs there. You can also find them through the agenda page. Um, blue sheets, I did that. Uh, we need a Zulip scribe. Is anyone willing to be our Zulip scribe? In case people write to Zulip. I can monitor the chat. Okay, great. And we need two note takers who are willing to take notes in the notes app. We don't get to have a meeting unless we have two note takers. So I know Alan's looking at me and saying, I'm going to be talking half the time. Okay, fine. But anybody who is not going to be talking half the time. Okay, Michael, uh, anybody over there? Notes takers? I need one more. If Michael can put my lights on. I can. I'm really lazy. I mean, usually, usually I go over the video yeah, recording. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Okay, sounds good. Our agenda today, um, first thing is going to be uh, Jan Fred talking about the DTLS encryption for RADIUS. Uh, that document, um, we'll talk about the status of that document during the talk. Uh, RADIUS 
version 1.1 will be Alan. Uh, that document is, I think, just been accepted as a working group work item officially, uh, but is also approaching working group last call. So um, the, the uh, adopting it as a working group document had a little delay at the end because we forgot to send the official mail. So, um, and then COA and RADIUS uh, already went through last call and is, um, no, not COA, TLS, PSK. That's not even being talked about here because it already went through last call and is um, in what's called Shepherd's Review, getting ready to send it to Paul, who did walk in. That's Paul, if you want to talk to our AD. Um, COA will be presented, a deprecating insecure practices and RADIUS. These are all working group work items at this point, even if their names don't reflect that, I believe. And then there's an item that's not a working group item, um, status realm. And I'm not 100% sure we have a talk on that because I didn't get slides. So people don't get to talk or don't send me the slides. Um, and then uh, radius accounting assurance is a presentation um, from um, the, I think it's, is it the WBA also? Uh, and they want to come and talk to us about accounting and what's going on with accounting. Uh, and then that's it. Uh, <clears throat> just recently on the 7th, um, so too close to this meeting to be a topic on our agenda, uh, we received a liaison letter from the Wi-Fi, the Wireless Broadband Alliance. And um, this is about a signaling AP location for Wi-Fi roaming. Um, the document was made available to us in the email, so you can go and actually read the document. Their, not, their documents aren't public, but we have a copy. It includes radius signaling of the location of a mobile device, i.e. a person, uh, within about 10 meters. Um, it gives civic street address information and GPS coordinates, potentially. Um, it does note <coughs> that this has significant privacy and security implications. But it, at least in my opinion, or, you know, we don't know what the working group's opinion is yet, it doesn't then specify all of the follow-ons from that about what type of security is needed. Um, as I said, it was too late to have a deep discussion here. It wasn't in by the two-week deadline. Uh, but there has started to be some discussion on the list. And I'm wondering, and this is in a way a question for Paul as well as the working group, um, how should we produce, I mean, they sent us a formal letter. We should probably produce a consensus working group response. And, and if, if we should do that, the follow-on question is, how should we do that? So... Let's first discuss if we should do that. Yeah, Paul about this AD. Um, yeah, we should we should definitely think about a response, but I actually want to pull in some more ISG people to uh, before making final decisions. So let's let's definitely talk about this. But if people want to discuss this more on the working group, so that we I have as much information as I have to talk to the ISG, then we'll see how to deal with the response. Right, and then that's pretty much what I said is continue um, mailing list discussion. And then I was thinking there might need to be a design team or something. Cause I think we'd want to call in people outside this room. Like even though they sent it to the Radix working group, I'm not sure the Radix working group is the only part of the IETF that might have an opinion on this subject. So, um, so we will, uh, I will co coordinate with you after the meeting, Paul, about, you know, how you want us to come together on something like this. Um, so I guess, Wolfgang Beck, this work is um, used for emergency calls, perhaps, for emergency um, calls over those IPs. So I think this is a useful thing. The original RFC in the ITF, which there already is one, uh, talks about emergency calls. This is actually very much focused on moving you to the type of connectivity they want you to have in the location you're in. So they can know... Like they can move you from a cell tower to uh, metro Wi-Fi to a local Wi-Fi, depending on where you're located, and know if you're moving away from that space and they have to move you. So if they'll put you on your home when you're at home, and then when you're moving out of your home, they'll put you on the metro or the cheapest to them Wi-Fi that they can give you probably. <laughs> Hi, well, whatever. <laughs> the, one, the one your ISP wants you on. <laughs> this is, Alan, some of this is also geolocation for things like events. 
if you're in the event, you get access. And if you're physically out of the event, you do not. Um, There's also a, a localized advertising, localized I think. Localized advertising, billing, all this kind yeah. of stuff. Yeah. And right now, it, this isn't really, I mean, I, I don't know we wanna, how much we want to discuss this. We do have some time in our agenda, but we don't want this to turn into a 20-minute talk. But right now, your ISP already kind of knows where you are. Okay, this isn't about whether your ISP knows where you are. The question is, did they do a good job of signaling that over radius? And, uh, you know, I, it's a very complicated document. It's not something I feel like we can have a technical discussion on. I, Alan's probably read the whole thing already, but um, we don't have technical discussions on things that came in, you know, the first days of the meeting, typically. Uh, okay, we've got uh, people in the queue. Um, oh, Bernard, are you participating remotely i didn't i didn't catch you yeah i am okay uh, you're up just a correction um it is not used for emergency calling there um that's specified by regulatory agencies and the original work that probably the people to talk to are the people who worked in geopriv like i was the editor of, of this stuff but for geopriv so like uh, Alyssa cooper was very involved in and all that stuff um and those are the people to to talk to yeah, that's that's a good point. Um, I was just saying the original RFC that had these things over radius said it was for emergency calling, um, but this document, the, the liaison, doesn't list emergency calling at all. So that's that's what I was trying to say. Apparently, not very. Yeah, it was. It, I think we were confused at the time. It was never adopted by regulatory agencies. This this is something that's very strictly controlled legally, and it's never used anywhere for emergency calling. Okay, that sounds. I mean. Uh, you would know. <laughs> so, um, was there? There were two people in the queue, but someone dropped off. So I guess we're we're done with that. Um, so okay, so on to the next thing, um, which is the DTLS BIS document. So, yeah. Hi, I'm Janfred, and I have the perfect T-shirt for this draft. Um, yeah. So um, we're talking about the uh, Radex uh, Radius DTLS B draft. If you can go to the next slide, since the last meeting uh, at IETF one one seven. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Uh, we had a working group adoption call finished. Uh, the working group 00 version is published. We had some changes that were very significant, um, as we discussed in the meeting in San Francisco and thereafter on the mailing list. Um, we've updated the trust model that we require to um, have a certificate uh, based mutual authentication and PSK mandatory to implement for servers. Clients can choose one of them uh, as mandatory. Um, transport, um, TLS and DTLS mandatory to implement for servers. Clients can again choose to implement one or the other with both recommendation to implement both, but if they have good reasons for not doing that, then they can choose. Uh, we have updated the text on status server, keep alive mechanism all around that to mandate status server now. Um, uh, I think the old RFCs did not mandate it. They just recommended it. Um, I have added security considerations, which were basically copy paste from the old RFCs. And uh, as discussed, reference the uh, TLS best current practice um, for every, anything TLS version and Cypher suite and TLS related stuff. Is it working? It's not working. Okay. So um, what's still needed? Um, the the to-dos that are in the in the draft, we have not yet any text around session resumption. Um, I'm not exactly sure what the, the right thing is. We should say there um, any suggestions are welcome. Uh, we have had the request, I think, in... Uh, Yokohama already to have uh, implementation considerations on guidelines also into the draft. Also not exactly sure what to say there. 
maybe someone can provide some text there. Um, with the new security considerations, we also have to reiterate them. Is everything there that should be there? Can we remove some obvious sections or some sections that are now covered with the TLS BCP draft and we can just drop a pointer? And also, there are some things in the security considerations that might be worth moving to a normative section like uh, the migration path from UDP to TL radius TLS or radius DTLS has a few uh, capital musts in there. Maybe it's worth moving that away from the security considerations section to some operational um, consideration section. Uh, we have some small to do still in the document. They should be easy to fix. For example, um, we have the CA indication in the uh, 6614, so in the TLS um, standard in for DTLS, there is no CA indication. Maybe we should add that there. Um, we have the name PSK identifier. I think in the uh, old drafts, there was uh, it was called the TLS identifier. I'm not exactly sure. I think the name was just wrong. Um, port multi-use, subnets, all these is marked as to do in the uh, draft, so that should be there. Next slide. So at that point, um, I think the document with the small fixes should be ready, but let's take a step back now um, because we should ask ourselves the question again, what problem do we want to solve? Why did we start this document? And do we actually have that thing that we wanted from the beginning? So what we want to avoid is to have this document published as an RFC, and then in two years we have a ton of errata and need a new beast document because we forgot something. Um, so what do we need to finish this document and to have it actually ready to uh, submit it to the ISG? Um, is basically we need a checklist. Um, so first we need a thing, a list of things that were wrong with the old RFCs. So uh, 6613 is radius TCP. 6614 radius TLS and 7360 is radius DTLS. So that list we can tick off then and check if the new document actually has all the issues that we had with the old document fixed. Um, and then we need a list of additional features that we need for the new radius DTLS draft, um, which is a list that we can check to see if we actually need this new document and that it's not just, or that, that it's uh, really better to publish a new document merging all these three draft uh, uh, RFCs and we don't just, uh, and we shouldn't just republish the original RFC with the errata worked in as a new document just in the standards track. So that's a thing that we want to do and I think I'll refer to the chairs uh, in a minute to, to talk about how we progress from there. Uh, and I think I have a last slide of open issues from my point of view. If we have this list finished and everything's checked, um, then we should publish this document. I mean, the working group schedule expects this in January 2024. I'm not exactly sure if we can hold that deadline. We can try. Um, so um, the, the uh, deprecating insecure practices depends on this because um, if we haven't finished that document, then we can't really expect people to just shut off uh, radius UDP and migrate to something that's may maybe changing still. Um, we have one open dependency, at least for now, uh, for dynamic discovery. Um, that's still an experimental draft. Uh, I think right now I have this as a normative reference in there, so it would be a down ref. Um, I have quite a number of uh, reference issues that are um, that that the ID nits tool screams at me that uh, they are not right. Um, maybe we should reiterate them also and uh, decide if that's okay. Maybe some normative reference can be informative references. It's the first draft that I have that is this far along in the process, so I'm not really experienced with that. Um, and I think with that, I'm finished.
and we can go into the discussion about uh, what is still need to do and how we go on from here. So um, to just uh, to put a little context around um, our, our milestones in our charter do say January, um, there's a harder limit on this uh, in June of um, 2024 because this is needed as a, a standards track reference by MyFi Alliance. Um, but the hope is that we'll have it out in plenty of time and we won't be having last minute um, you know, issues with trying to get it out in time for that deadline. Uh, some of the stuff that Jan Fred said came out of some stuff issues that I raised is we have very few issues open with this document. One could almost think it's like ready to go to working group last call, except people had more, like when we said, well, can we just write a short document sending TLS to standards track? People were like, no, there's all these things wrong with the document that have to be fixed. Well, they haven't been fixed. So why do we have no issues against this document, right? We should have all those issues against this document, and maybe Jan Fren knew a few of them and fixed them, but not all of them. I don't. So where are they? Where is that list? And I think uh, maybe you're going to talk about putting up some GitHub stuff. Where are we? Bernard. Oh, Bernard, you're in the queue first. Yeah. So um, uh, just a question. Usually, you know, the WFA uh, they do fairly extensive tests, and it's often a great way to get bugs. Uh, in issues when they have to do all the tests and they'll ask you questions about stuff. So that might be one way of, of stimulating this review is, is don't, you don't have to be shy. You don't have to be like completely done to get into the WFA process and get the feedback from them. Like, you know, we got feedback on eight or two eleven security way, 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 way before we were done. So that's, that's a reason you should consider it a resource. I don't know if there's anyone in the room or in the working group that's a liaison to WFA or is working with them. But Do we can, have any actual liaisons to WFA, yeah. Wi-Fi Alliance? Or like just an informal person? No, I said WFA doing... in this case. I Yeah, yeah. yeah. Wi-Fi Alliance, Paul Valdos, AD. Um, so I, I was actually just chatting in the background with the IEB, and apparently we do not have liaisons, but we do send back and forth liaison statements to each other. Okay, so yeah, Do I mean, Dorothy but, Stanley can help. She, she yeah, I mean, I think when we doing. think it's pretty much ready, which will hopefully be in the next month or two, um, it, it would be good to tell them we think it's pretty much ready and would you review it before we finalize right, right. it? So thank you, Bernard. Alan? Yeah, um, this is Alan. So one of the things I, I talked about with Margaret yesterday in order to push this forward, I will take a task on putting uh, 6613, 6614, and 7360 up on GitHub. There's a Radix. Uh, organization there, and then we can start opening issues on that. Um, we, I believe we want to do it on GitHub and not anywhere else because they're not really errata. We don't want to file them through the right. IETF. It's just, this is the working group's discussion on, on what to fix. Yeah. So I'll, I'll do that next week. And then yeah, and put one up for the main document too, in case people have issues with that aren't on one of those other ones. Um, um, yeah, I think I can bring up my issue then on the on the GitLab. So, um, can bring it up here. <laughs> okay, um, it's a bit of focus on the radius v one one dot one. I think because there's some discussion missing about the use of UDP source ports. There's a section six three where you uh, said you have to use a proxy if you have multiple client instances that want to talk to one server. And that's something right now we are using the UDP source port to extend the ID. So you have more than 256 outstanding requests. And uh, the section 6.3 appears to discourage that um, usage. I, I so. think the, the, the idea of that section, if I'm, I'm not exactly sure, but I think that that is the, if, if you have multiple radius clients on one yeah. host, use a proxy. Um, the idea behind that sec yeah be the idea behind that section is that you have one so piece of software on the on the device that can do all the failover stuff and if that piece of software decides to open 50 udp source ports to maximize the the um, id space 
then that's the decision of that prox uh, that software. But the idea is not to have the 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 configuration effort on all this client software, but you, that you can have one central uh, server where you can put all the policies and these local. Of course, a proxy is only one way to do it. You could share those information between those clients. But I I don't. It's just, just a bit misleading here. So. Yeah. Okay. I don't. I don't think that there are any must statements in there. So if you choose to, to I've do read it, it then... like okay, I can't change the US UDP source code. Okay. Anymore, so. We'll we'll look into into the, the the wording there and and reiterate that. Okay. Thanks for your input. Um. Yeah. Fabian. <laughs> Fabian Mauchle switch. Um. Just a few results from the hackathon. Uh. We did some intro testing with the WBA while well, we were open roaming. Um, basically, the certificate validation of server certificates is a mess. So, <laughs> if I'm honest, I think during the hackathon, we simply turned off the <coughs> certificate validation to get it to work at all. <laughs> I, I, I did say something about this, do not validate in, in EAP. <laughs> yeah, so basically it is, I think in, in the drafts, it's, it's section 421. Uh, server certificate validation. Um, you should look at this in more detail. There even was just two days ago, they published uh, RFC 9525, uh, service identity in TLS. Um, you should probably reference that document and follow the, the advice they give you on what to specify in your own document. Um, the one thing I kind of missed in there, or where I'm not sure, we, def we define how to validate the server certificate. What's not in this is how to issue server certificates and what to put in there. I guess this would be in the dynamic discovery. Yeah, so what is 7585? which is experimental at the moment. So defining how to validate it is one thing, but we should also define what you put in there. Otherwise, interop is going to be still a mess. Um, to make sure we don't lose those, could you, once Alan sends the GitHub um, locations, make sure that gets into GitHub as issues, even if you don't have answers for it. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm happy to, pro to provide a proposal for what to specify. Yeah, there. a proposal is even better. <laughs> um, I put myself in the list for my my own comment, um, and uh, I, you know, there's the the question like, you know, can we just uh, sort of point to the other documents and say, move that to standards track, move that to standards track, um, Jan Fred. You know, on one of these slides, po pointed out the reasons to have one document, which um, are that we can say um, servers need to implement both, clients may implement either, and you can't really do that unless you have a document that either specifies or points to both. So um, we did already decide in the working group to move to one document and to have those things in it, uh, that what the specific specifications are about who has to implement what. Um, so that's that's one argument for moving them into a cent central document. So that just with my hats off. Um, so uh, that was that, Kari. Uh, yeah, this is Kar Kari Huhtanen from Radiator Software. So uh, I wanted to kind of con continue commenting on what Fabian said there. And uh, I have been also doing the kind of uh, open roaming from the wireless broadband alliance side. And I think he, we definitely need to kind of check the RFCs and the drafts, how uh, we should do the certificate validation, what to check there. But in that hackathon, the part of the problem was that some of the certificates uh, didn't have this kind of, let's say, they didn't follow the current rules to be used. So they were, for example, missing the CN from the subject alt name and all that kind of things. So that caused problems in, in the testing. But it would be good that when we do uh, these drafts, we kind of ensure that we have some kind of clear view how do we validate the certificates there. 
So um, just to comment, try to be cl not not specifically you, everyone. Try to be very close to that mic when you talk. If you can't hear it broadcasting, it's not going over to the people who are listening from home. So. All right. Yeah. Thanks. And uh, Valerie. Uh, I just want to second what Fabian said about uh, uh, referring to RFC 9525. I'm speaking now as co-chair of Future Working Group. Uh, it was uh, a very well uh, developed, a very hard work was put into this document about uh, server identity. So uh, we just, uh, we might want to uh, rely on this work and uh, use this document uh, in in this draft and also rely on uh, 7225, which is about uh, the guidelines for using TLS and applications, uh, the generic guides, guidelines. So that's it. I'll, I'll definitely look through those documents again and see what, what we can leverage from these documents uh, to avoid double specification. Uh, Valerie, maybe you can. Valerie, put what, this in, which in the document chat? were you specifying? Uh, 9325. Uh, this is 93 a generic. 9325. 9325. 9325. And 9525. 9525 is just was published about a week ago and uh, or less. Uh, it is uh, a document about uh, specifying server identities uh, in TLS. Are we anything else okay. on this one or are we on to the next one? I'm trying to confirm my selection. There we are. Yeah. Um, you, so you still have your hand raised. Oh, I should undo that. Ta -da. <laughs> uh, so, Alan, you, I think you got the next three, right? Yes. Um, radius 1-1. One, one. Yes? No? Does this work? It did it not. Has to be plugged into your, your laptop. That has to be plugged into my laptop? Yeah. How... Whoever, who, whoever's sharing the slide. It doesn't have a thing. I mean, there's no plugging in. No, there's a do the key with an orange cable <laughs> hanging around Does... the desk. Two hickey orange cable. Nothing. No. Well, I, 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 I it you I it worked loose in another room I was in, so I don't. There's not even a, a place to plug it in. <laughs> in the meantime, I'll ask. I can Mar push Margaret a button to go to. The next I can slide. push this button right here. There we go. <laughs> um. So, on, on with technical content and less AV. Um. Based on Hecky's comments, re-added the Radius 1-0 ALPN name. The idea there is that it signals we can do this, but we're not doing it right now. Um, there's a bunch of text which is cleaned up and clarified based on everyone's feedback that helped a lot. And it's shipping as an experimental build. If you go poke the build system, it's not on by default. Um, it seems to work when it interoperates with itself. As for other ones, I don't know. Um, I believe most people will be implementing this with OpenSSL and OpenSSL will interoperate with itself. So it shouldn't be an issue. Um, status, we have a call for acceptance as working group document. Um, minor comment from Peter Deacon about clarifications, but no response to the suggestion text. So I'm assuming it's correct. Um, we could publish this as experimental independent of the 6614 biz or depending on processes we could wait for 6614 biz and publish this as a standard and stomp all over udp and tcp there are benefits and drawbacks to both the document is mostly finished so we could publish it as experimental tomorrow Whereas if we wait for 6614 biz, it will be three, six months, whatever the time frame is. Um, and it will just be sitting there waiting. Yeah, um, just to make it clear, um, 
we have an open call for acceptance as a work, working group last call. So we couldn't publish it tomorrow because we have to wait for the working group last call to finish. But um, yeah, I think maybe we'll make a call out to the working group to see uh, whether there's consensus to publish it as experimental now or to ma make it blocking on um, the what's now called the DTLS biz document. Um, did you have thoughts on that? Trying to put your hand up. <laughs> too many, sorry, too many taps on my phone. Uh, Paul Vardar City, if you're publishing this as experimental, um, could you make sure to put a time frame in that you think this experiment will last? And even if that's like six months and never go to standard, that would be really great. Yeah, okay. Good. So that we avoid these problems of we've got these 10 year old RFCs that we want to have status change on. Yeah, I think uh, it it may be. Um, <laughs> I don't know what those would be. Um, is it? <laughs> it's, well, I mean, we didn't used to that long ago say why they were experimental. That's the, you know. But now we do, and so if we published it as experimental, it would have to say what what the experiment was. Um, you know, putting. I could raise my hand. Has anyone else raised theirs? No. I, I'm going to not raise and unraise my hand at this time. Um, but for my personal opinion. I would rather we just referenced the BIS document and waited for it. But, and, you know, it'd be effectively published. I mean, it'd be through working group last call. It would be waiting in RSC editor queue land or something for the re document it references to come along. Um, but I think that, I don't think anyone's waiting for it in a formal standards body that needs the red stamp. Do you know what I mean? We, it would be done. It would be just as done. And when the other document came along, it would get the RFC number. And that would be my preference. Yeah, I, I, I'd be happy with leaving this for DTLS biz. One of the reasons is I, I think in terms of marketing slash mindshare, it would be better to say it is now standard to not use 30-year-old garbage, uh, much as it seems to sort of work still, as opposed to, oh, we're thinking of not doing it. Yeah, but by the time we get this out of working group last call into um, shepherding, through shepherding, into the ISG, through the ISG, and into the RFC editor queue, hopefully we're, we're already doing like working group last calls on DTLS or something. I mean, I, I don't see why the, what the value of sort of a week, short intermediate experimental period would be. That's just my opinion, not not a chair opinion. Chairs are happy to publish things as experimental if the working group wants them to. Yeah, doesn't doesn't matter much to me. Okay, next. Uh, oh, oh, next slide set right, or is there another one in here? Oh, oh, somebody's here, Bernard. Yeah, I, I agree with you uh, that um, I don't think there's value in experimental. Uh, particularly because I think the working group wants this to be implemented along with all the other stuff, right? Like for the WFA. So you might, if it's an experimental status, it'll signal to them, hey, this isn't really part of the package. And I don't think you want that. So have it all be standard at the same time, I think it makes more sense. And it nothing nothing should stop anybody from implementing it, I don't think. Or if, or if they are stopped, you should talk to them and say, hey, don't worry about it. Yeah, the, the, the patches to free radius were a thousand lines of code. So, you know, I, I think any large company should get that within a six or six month or one year time frame for new, new releases. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, next presentation, deprecating insecure practices. Uh, next slide. Um, so this is the document that started off as deprecating UDP and TCP transports. And we very quickly realized there was a whole bunch of stuff which was terrible, which needed to be deprecated. Um, similar to the previous document, um, it may be worth waiting on uh, DTLS biz to actually publish this. It would be good to publish this as a standard. Um, Bernard just had a very long review which uh, I will respond to after the meeting in next week. Um, a lot of good points there. It's not the issues raised about passwords and chap and MS chap are not just about radius UDP. They're also about um, where you're doing radius over TLS and then proxying it over radius UDP or potentially using TTLS closing the TTLS tunnel and then proxying the inner data 
elsewhere. So it's wherever that data is not protected by T TLS, um, there are all these issues. And it's, it's just a lot of small, minor feedback and rewording and whatever. Um, one yeah, the, I saw that. Thank you, Bernard. That was really awesome feedback. Yeah, one of the, the, the major changes from 117 is I found, uh, I, I hadn't seen this before, there was an article that I won't say the name of because it's a little weird, um, but someone basically breaking MS chat in milliseconds on laptops. So if your passwords were sent over the internet in the last 20 years as MS chat, um, someone knows who, what they are. And yeah, you all, certain things like MS chat and whatever, only do them inside TLS tunnels where nobody has access to them. Uh, next slide. Um, I already said all this. Yeah, I added some text on PAP versus CHAP and password storage. This is a common misconception I run into a lot. Um, CHAP is more secure because it doesn't send the password across the internet. Well, PAP doesn't either. Uh, and the question is, if you have CHAP, now your database has to have your passwords in clear text. And what's more likely? Someone breaks into your databases and steals 10 million clear text passwords, or they break into some other network thing and watch the clear text passwords for PAP go by one by one. Um, there's just, there's no question. PAP is simply more secure. Um, and there is no document which says that. And lots of articles and websites and expert alleged things on the net which say that CHAP is more secure. Um, and this is a way to get those people to shut up and go away. Next slide, please. Um, it's been accepted on as a working group document. I believe other than Bernard's comments, it's mostly done. I would like, I think, the, the best thing here is sort of get agreement that it's done and again, wait for 6614 for So I have a personal comment. Um, I think we should stay away from the argument about whether PAP or CHAP or, and just say, don't use either of these. They are both entirely insecure in, as plain text, you know, if they're not wrapped in a tunnel. I would very much like to say that there are hundreds of millions of users, user accounts with cryptid passwords or whatever else. It's, it's hard. G given people will continue to use imperfect processes, they need to be told, I believe, how to use them properly or better. Um, but I'm sure Bernard has opinions on that. Well, I, I'm more in agreement with Margaret on this because, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, but I think most of that usage is a legacy junk anyway. So like, uh, you know, I don't even know, is dial-up networking still around? And we finally dumped all that stuff in the landfill. Uh, but, you know, and, and stuff that is horrifically bad, like some of the EPTTLS stuff that you referred to. So, you know, my question is, these I, I, I'm more in agreement with you. Don't send any of these attributes in a radius, you know, conventional radius packet and just you know, is there any need to do this, I guess, is my question, uh, you know, nowadays. I, I, I'm happy to add some text saying something like that, right? Like, if you have any choice at all, use anything other than <laughs> pap chop, blah, 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 blah. Um, but maybe some of the ed your own people can correct me if I'm wrong. Well, I, I was going to say there are people who are watching this document. Um, I, I have a bunch of hats in the world, so taking off this hat and putting on my community architecture uh, for trust and identity chair hat for Internet 2, um, we have a group called the EAC under the cacti, um, which is uh, looking into um, recommended practices for Edgerome and um, documenting them, updating a document we wrote a long time ago. And they are looking right at this document to see what the IETF recommends. Uh, so that they can recommend yeah. it. So say something good. So, yeah, and like for Edgerome, right? There would never be a reason why you would have to send these these attributes, right? Hopefully. 
Am I no. missing something? No, we do have some people who do them, and we would like oh, to wow. be able to firmly suggest that they stop. Um, and we're working on that. Okay. And the more firmly we suggest it in this document, the easier it is for us to make that suggestion. Not that we can't make it ourselves. I mean, I'm not saying we're just weak, but when it's in a document like this, there's no no question. You know, we don't have, we do have people saying, well, but CHAP is kind of secure, isn't it? And I'm like, no, no, no. it is not. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll echo comments. <laughs> Stefan Winter isn't here, but I'll echo the comment he had the other day. And from what he's seen in Eduron, there are tens of thousands of IDPs authenticating users, some of whom have many thousands of customers and a very substantial percentage are still using peep ms chat v2 or ttls it is extremely difficult to move 10 million 100 yeah million but they don't but they, they that should never use those attributes though it shouldn't it, it's it's always it's it should only be done in eap that was guidance that we, sure. we gave in like 1998 okay so so if, if yes if, if you're talking about inside of EAP or whatever, TTLS, whatever. Yeah, yes, but that helps. Um, I do know there are cloud providers who send this kind of stuff across the internet. Yeah, that's horrible, though. Just in plain <laughs> radius, <laughs> and they should yeah. not do it. They, we they should, should deprecate not, it. it. Yeah, be, yeah. Um, Michael. Um, to Bernard's point, I believe PPTP is still a thing, yes, over IPsec, but what tends to happen is that the IPsec tunnel is not well authenticated. Paul can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but the PPTP then has a username password, which the the NAS, the RAS, whatever, uh, passes over with radius. And of course, everyone thinks, oh, well, that's just all internal traffic, isn't it? Until, of course, it's not. And so there's, you know, very minimal security for that. So I, I would say this, this, this would be a, a, a useful thing to say uh, in this. Um, it's also saying, please stop doing uh, UDP radius, right? Which they're doing right now because they didn't know anything. They haven't changed anything in 12 years. Um, and uh, I think that that would be useful because it would show up on an auditor report. And right, they would right. Have to fix it, right? Yes. Or throw away that junk finally, right? Which may be the cheapest way to, to fix the problem. Okay. Okay, so I think the consensus is to add more text saying what to do and what not to do. I hope there is no consensus to remove the text on PAP versus chat and MS chat because it's still worth beating people up over that. It's just clarifications and it's largely addressing Bernard's comments as raised on the list. Okay. Next document. Oh, and the final thing I think would be probably wait for 6614 biz before we publish the deprecation one. That way the deprecation one can be a standard too. Um, uh, sorry, Bernard in skew. One last comment from Bernard. Oh. Bernard? Yeah, I, I did have one one comment on the document, um, Alan, which is you have kind of an exception for secure networks. Yes. And th this is something that it's just kind of a pet peeve of mine because I remember everyone thinks their network is secure, like my kid is above average. Uh, but... <laughs> You know, and I've seen it. I've seen that excuse used to do hor horrific things. That was the excuse used to send diameter in the clear with no security at all, not even radius authenticator, right? My network is secure, and everyone says that. But if that were true, how would we have all these compromises, right? Yeah. And and so I, I just feel like is that really a good a good excuse? I Does that really get you get you out of all this? Probably not. Yes, it, if people believe their networks to be secure, but uh, my experience has been people don't even check. Right, right. So it's, I just think particularly, you know, I think what you want is, is like was said, you want, you want this to show up in an audit and, and you don't get out of it just because you think that your kid is above average. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, um, I, I think the, 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 the text in the draft should be fairly clear that with that, we mean just the actual knock VLAN that is that we use for management anyway. Um, so I think it's reasonable to 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 say, okay, if if that net is actually taken over, then we we have bigger problems than radius. Um, but I think that there should be very strong wording if that, to to suggest that. This should be only if you really think um, 
anything more secure is not yeah. good because yeah, uh, your, your equipment doesn't support anything other. Effectively, if, you know, to say it a different way, if you can point at the two machines and see the wire between them and maybe a switch, it might be okay. Otherwise, it's almost definitely not okay. I think there's right. plenty. I think there's plenty of bandwidth on a crossover cable to do encryption. So, um, but I. Uh, <laughs> um, but I actually, I, I agree with Bernard's suggestion because um, we get there's a lot in security. Okay, and it's like, well, it's not always about them cracking your password. Sometimes we're just sending user information in the clear, and when linked with other things in the packet, it can violate someone's privacy. And, you know, I don't think that everyone goes out and quarries their uh, IT staff before they allow them to see the traffic flowing on the knock. Okay, so just keep it private. I mean, you know, no, people will violate us for their one weird special case where there's blah, 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 blah. But let that be a violation. Don't make that an okay thing to do across your campus backbone because you think it's secure. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I agree now. Uh, next document. Reverse COA. Um, I, I still like to have a better name for this because reverse for this because reverse COA really confuses people. This, yeah, I know. Inverse some inverse COA something. I don't know. The idea is essentially. If you can't talk to the, if the proxy, sorry, home, the radio server cannot talk to the NAS because it's behind a firewall, NAT gateway, whatever, but still wants to send COA packets to it. Well, if you have a TLS tunnel, TLS tunnel goes both ways, just stuff COA packets down that TLS tunnel. Um, this works for a couple of different vendors. Um, the original proposal had some negotiation, which people didn't like, so all that's gone. Um, and the text really is when you reverse, when you're sending packets in reverse, use the operator name for, ro for proxying until you get to the home network, in which case it's the home network's problem to get that packet to the final NAS. And there really isn't a lot here. Um, it is coded, it is implemented, it does work. Um, and this definitely should be experimental because it's a little weird, um, but extremely useful. And the WBA is also watching this because they do have this as an issue. Uh, people get on the net and then whatever, stolen credit card, whatever, and you cannot kick them off. Um, as a chair, I'll comment that if we publish things as experimental today, uh, we need to say um, what the experiment is and how long it's going to go on. So I don't think the document says that right now. And you should Give propose two, something. Two or something um, worth coming back. Regarding to the name, reverse rare A is a bit confusing, I think. In ZIP, we called it session reuse. Because it's yeah. something. Yeah. Um, so, go ahead, Paul. Just, just a, a short comment, Paul. Because um, I guess sort of as AD, if you go one slide back. Uh, can I do that? Yes. I have the technology. Um, if, if I, if I, if I ever have more working groups that say that our main vendors has been shipping this for more than one year, we need additional review. I, I would be really happy, but. Um, that, Maybe you don't need additional review. <laughs> <laughs> so the vendors have been shipping this in that they will accept these packets over that TLS tunnel. There aren't many radius server implementations for that multi-chain proxying. So we know the basic idea works. Um, it would be good to have two interoperable implementations on the radius server side. I see, okay, that. I, I believe ICE may do it. I have to check out um, the other co-author on the draft and just double check. Okay, so that, that seems a good reason for me to say, let's wait and get more more vendor, more experience and more yeah. VP. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll check with um, the other co-author. If it's implemented in ICE, then I'll update this and then we can just push it out and, pick a time, a year, two years or something, and then rev the document after. 
Yeah, I think it's um, not that we just want to wait around on this document. We have other things that are very pressing. Um, and so this document is less pressing and it's a working group document. And it, I think we're really going to turn our attention to the DTLS as much as we can because we need to get that out. It's got other things blocked behind it. It's needed by um, the WFA. So and there's, there's been essentially no... Uh, it was, it this is. This one, I believe, was accepted as a working group. Yes, I, it was. Um, I think the next slide says that, in fact. But yes, it was. And it hasn't been revved the name yet, I think. Uh, uh, so the next version, he'll probably do that. Yeah, given the fact that there's essentially no feedback on this, publish it as experimental and see what happens, see what blows up. Um, we can always fix it with a standards track document. So I, I think this would be barring typos and wordsmithing, I'd be ready to publish now. And the experiment. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I believe that's it. And then um, we did get slides for... Uh, oh, Margaret, this is Christian. This. Yeah. Yes, Sebastian Schrader, TU Dresden. Just a minor suggestion on the name. How about COA piggyback? Sure. That, that is a little clearer. Okay. So um, we did get slides on the status realm um, document. So, um, Mark, are you going to come present that? Yeah. Cool. Um, so this was one of our uh, first uh, uh, documents for the group. And I stand way next to the mic. Okay. Um, one of our first documents for the group, I updated it uh, back before um, uh, 117, uh, but failed to get it there. So here we, we've got an update here. Um, so we've got some draft updates and a few open questions. Next. All right. Draft updates. We've got a couple of clerical ones, uh, spelling correction, phrasing differences, naming consistencies. Um, Protocol-wise, uh, we've got uh, status realm uh, response code numbers were updated. Somebody uh, uh, noticed on the list that the uh, response codes were, uh, uh, um, they had a gap and an overlap that happened to coincide fairly well. Uh, <laughs> actually, could you go on to the next slide? Uh, I, we, uh, uh, I'm I documented this. Um, 257 to 260 were decremented since 256 was omitted and 260 was overlapping. So uh, hooray, those, uh, um, that, that worked well. Next. Pardon me? Okay. Um, time Delta, uh, the uh, server information now has an integer added to it, an integer field named Time Delta. The idea of that is that this is the uh, amount of time that a particular server sees for the round trip when it when it forwards things on. You have server A, B, C, D. Um, the time delta is, uh, for server C encompasses all of the time that it took for uh, this time delta for server B. Excuse me, would encompass all of the uh, um, time in milliseconds that it took for the packets to go from B to C, C to D. D to C, C back to B. Um, this gives us ping response times effectively. Um, responding server, uh, target server details. Uh, it's a, a server information block about the target realm server, uh, just broken out into a uh, uh, into the um, responding server. Uh, it broken out into a separate section, I should say. And I think that was it. Um, open questions. Uh, I did not uh, get to putting slides in on the open questions. Uh, one of them was uh, MTU constraints for the uh, additional server ID information. Uh, I think that was answered on the list. Um, it was suggested that that's not an issue. Uh, I'd like to pull the room or get a sense of the room as to uh, whether anybody has any further uh, uh, further uh, um, concerns? Concerns, yes, thank you. Okay. So any, oh, can we just take any comments on this document at all or do you have stuff there? 
I've got Delta. another two uh, uh, two questions. Um, the second open question I have is uh, uh, there was a chat or there was comments about specific uh, errors for max hop count uh, specific to the um, request type. Um, and I could use some uh, help on some of them because I've only really dealt, uh, I'm an Edgerome person, I've only really dealt with access requests. So I don't actually know COA or uh, accounting stuff at all. So if there's anything specific, any good responses, uh, I, I could use the help. And then uh, my uh, last point was, uh, our last open question was uh, max hop count. Um, there was a uh, request, I think, from Alan that that uh, a question about whether that should be only in the status realm or whether that should be in. Uh, I think this, the the uh, document suggested it should be in uh, access request packets as well. And I think Alan objected to that. It was months ago at this point. <laughs> I say to Alan, who's shrugging, thinking that he has no idea what I'm talking about. <laughs> um... Yeah, thinking about it some more, there, there are good reasons for it to be there and not there. Mainly it's proxy loops. People configure proxy loops. And rather than looking for 300 proxy um, state attributes, you could look for a max hop count or something. It's, I don't know. There's no good answer to any of this. It's all just trade-offs of different kinds of garbage. Yeah, but when you do... Um... As one of the authors of the draft, and this is a comment as one of the authors of the draft, when you write a draft, you have to say what packet types it's an option is allowed to be in. So the question is, do you want to forbid people to have it in an access accept, or do you want to allow them to have it in an access, I mean, access request? And, um, I, you know, I could see it being potentially valuable to pre prevent loops. I don't see it as being the only way to prevent loops, but I don't see why we would forbid it. Yeah, I, I, I guess I agree. It, it wouldn't cause a problem. It may be worth going, I don't know, it's allowed to be there. And whatever it means is <laughs> mostly what it says, but it's up to you. Too bad. Yeah. So, I mean, some people wouldn't implement it. So, yeah, I mean, but um, uh, putting back on my chair hat, uh, there's been discussion of this on the list. It's kind of run to an end of the discussion, which doesn't mean we're done discussing the document, but at this point, um, people have kind of had their first pass through it. Um, just trying to get a sense of the people who are in this room and on the call, I would like someone to tell me how to do a poll. Because <laughs> 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 I'd like to do a poll for whether people think this is ready to be accepted as a working group document, because it's not at this time, but I can't do that unless I can figure out how to do a poll. Show of hands. I can, that I can do it. Happens. You could do it. Awesome. You go do it. Yes. <laughs> so this is yes, no. Um, should we accept this document as a working group document at this point? When when he's done, a poll will appear on your screen. I, I mean, most of you have probably seen this somewhere. You have a phone app. I mean, <laughs> a show of hands has been started. Click here to show it. Oh, I did something wrong then. Or oh, no, there it is. Now it's asking you for your opinion, Margaret. And showing it on the screen. Yeah, I, yeah, I'm one of the authors. I think it should be accepted as a working group work document. <laughs> but as a chair, I'm asking a perfectly neutral question, uh, to which I will express my personal opinion. So seeing here, uh, there's a little bit of uncertainty with someone who went no, yes. But um, other than that, we have <laughs> that, that, very... That was me. I have... <laughs> <laughs> the, 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 the app interface, I think, needs some help. <laughs> but anyway, it looks like the uh, you know prevailing opinion is yes, except as a working group document. We will confirm it on the list. Um, and so unless no, there's a post. Right. Yeah. We'll conf is that was, were you just agreeing with me? Yes, we'll take it to the list. And um yes, I agree. and assuming it prevails there, uh we will make it a working group work document. So 
Great. Fun. Yep. Thank you very much. And next up. Next up is uh, the Radius Accounting Insurance presentation. Um, Ryan, are you here or on the phone? Yes. Oh, you're you're you, on the you online. Yes, yes, I can. Um, so Ryan is going to present. Um, I I think I can let you control the slides. Okay. May I open the door to improve air circulation? Uh, sure. If it's quiet out there, great. Um, what uh, does anyone know? How I let him do the slides? Uh, okay. Just, uh, did you find? I didn't find it. You need to request it. They said. Okay. Uh, is it under? Uh, I'm just trying to find the button here. Oh, okay. I see it. So oh, I did. Well, Okay. okay, there you go. And okay. um, take it away. Thank you. Okay, so uh, um, thank you, everyone. Uh, this is uh, so we're, uh, I'm involved in, well, let me just give you a, a short background here. Uh, this uh, Radius Accounting Assurance is a project within the WBA, the Wireless Broadband Alliance. And we basically were, we, we deal with. Uh, misreporting and radius accounting. So any kind of accounting messages that come in, any kind of accounting sessions that uh, misreport their usage. Uh, for example, if, if uh, the end user you know, roams onto a Wi-Fi network and there's accounting that's generated and this end user used one gigabyte, but the accounting session reported five gigabytes, uh, this, that would be you know, an example of misreporting, and this is something that we are first, we're flagging, we're trying to set up um, conditions to flag the accounting sessions, uh, it, like detect this misreporting first, and then you know, find out, uh, you know, work with other groups to, to see what we could do about it. Um, in, in our world, in the WBA, you know, roaming world, uh, there's often... Uh, cases where the the person roaming, um, you know, for example, uh, you know, I'm just using this example, AT and T. I have an AT and T phone. I roam onto a coffee shop, uh, and then you know, a certain amount of data is used, and um, then this is all tracked. But some, you know, some in some cases, the uh, the the person roaming has to pay the hotspot operator per gig. So, you know, everything that comes out of radius accounting is important to us. Uh, this, you know, the octets used, the gigawords, um, you know, the session time, all of that is means, you know, something to us. Um, and I'll get to, to this later. Um, and I, I see Bernard has his uh, hand raised. Uh, can we talk yeah. About um, okay. Well, it's actually important to talk about this because RFC 2975 describes why radius accounting is not appropriate for use in situations where packets translate to money. And maybe you can get mm -hmm. around this by using TCP, but if dropping a packet means dropping money, you've got a problem with, with financial statements and, and financial regulation that you can't get around. Um, in other words, and, and we learned this back in 1975, 1995 when we were trying to take companies public. If you're using radius accounting, you're not going to pass financial standards. So th there's a real, th the idea that somehow radius accounting is used, in, uh, you know, in where sessions translate to money, that's a real problem. Um, and you need, you need, you can't use UDP for that. You're going to lose packets and lose money. And, and that's, an, that's an issue. It's going to make your financial statements non-auditable. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I totally understand, you know, the, U, the UDP um, issue there. Um, uh, but I, I, think I'll, I think I'll move on uh, here. Um, but, uh, yeah, so, uh, and thank you. Thanks for that comment. And, um, 
So uh, just one, you know, one background, uh, just, just so on the agenda here, I just, I just wanted to show you like what I'm going to talk about uh, here. Uh, so we have a, uh, it's, uh, I'm just first going to just go over, you know, who we are and our objectives. Uh, and then I'll just go through the issues that we've seen in radius accounting. Uh, and I just want to just show uh, the, you know, so just some of our, just some gray areas that we've seen, um, something that, you know, this group might be interested in. Um, you know, we've also, uh, you know, we're also addressing uh, just some, some of the misreporting. Uh, I just want to talk about that a little bit um, and just what we've seen um, in, in the wild here with, with radius accounting. Um, you know, just uh, some of the conditions we've seen or just some of the sessions that we've seen that were just unrealistic. Um, and then the, the last one, I don't have a slide for, I just wanted to, this is something that we, this group might not be as interested in. It's just some documents that we're editing within the wireless broadband plans. Um, so the next slide, uh, just uh, here's just some of our uh, objectives here. Uh, we, we, you know, we first want to, uh, you know, clarify and understand radius. Uh, this is something that we've, you know, started kind of early this year. This is, you know, the beginning of the year. That's when this project started. Uh, we just want to talk, we're, you know, we're trying to bring attention to gray areas and radius accounting. And we also have conducted a vendor survey to see how vendors are implementing things in, on the, in the accounting world. Um, and uh, secondly, we, we have, uh, you know, we have some misreporting um, detection. Uh, we have some methods of misreporting detection that we've come, that we've, the group has uh, came up with. Um, and uh, secondly, you know, next year, we're actually going to define test cases for uh, testing vendor equipment to make sure that they uh, are, are reporting the correct usage um, and, uh, and we're also setting up a defect, uh, tracker. So just a little bit about us. Uh, we have, um, our leadership team is, um, uh, Tim and, and I, uh, Tim's of AT&T and I'm with single digits. Uh, single digits is, a like a clearing house. We, we process, process, uh, accounting traffic and radius traffic from pretty much every vendor under the sun. We, we have hundreds of uh, access networks, hotspot operators uh, talking to us. Um, and as you know, as you're well, you're aware of what you know, AT&T, they're an IDP, an identity provider. Um, but we have a lot of individuals from um, you know, other parts in the, the radius flow, the radius path, uh, hotspot operators, identity providers, and, uh, equipment vendors as well. So that's our group. That's who we are. Um, and and uh, so here on this slide, uh, I just want to show you some of the gray areas uh, that we've seen. Um, the first one, uh, the accounting session ID, the accounting multi-session ID. Uh, we sometimes find it's not unique enough. Uh, some packets have it, you might see as, you know, just a simple, you know, few characters, uh, and and we we you know, accounting session ID is important to us uh, because it, it definitely helps us uh, mediate a session and you know look at uh, you know correlate you know combine all the accounting records together, um, and and as an extension to that, we the the um, RFCs are saying that. Uh, you know, like, or according to RFCs, uh, I think 2865 or one of those, the accounting session ID is optional in the authentication packets. Um, but something that we want that's not listed here is actually we would prefer if it's mandatory in an authentication as well. So we could associate off with accounting. Uh, so that's, that's one of the one thing that we want improved uh, that that would make us that would help us. Um, 
Number two, uh, beating of uh, accounting multi-session ID. Uh, we've noticed some vendors include it, some don't. Um, but there's an uh, RFC here that's saying it's useful for roaming scenarios, which is which is great. And uh, this is something that we've we've kind of clarified through a vendor survey that that they're actually a lot of vendors are using accounting uh, multi-session ID and, and roaming and. Uh, um, it's it's consistent throughout the roaming and um, uh, if, you know fast roamings if that's disabled and a new session occurs for every roam uh, event from one AP to another the accounting multi session stays the same which is which is great uh, so this kind of was a gray area but not anymore through the survey uh, number three uh, we class echo uh, we we've seen some equipment. Uh, not actually echoing the class. Uh, this is another thing that helps us that we add to the radius accounting. We add the class uh, and it helps us, you know, mediate sessions and, um, you know, if, if some, some equipment, first of all, doesn't actually echo the class. Uh, and then there's the other problem of the upper limit of how many class attributes are echoed. You know, different radius servers in the hop and, and you know different radius servers would or radius proxies would add a class um but we don't so you know with some equipment uh, has an upper limit um uh, and, and we're just unclear on what that upper limit is uh so some kind of clarification here would be good uh the number four and this is something that came up in the vendor survey sometimes there's a uh some, if there's some kind of internal issue to the AP, uh, how could that be communicated uh, through the through the accounting? Like if something uh, wasn't calculated correctly, um, how how could how could they signal that? How could the AP signal that? Um, and we've seen that some vendors, at least one, would actually set the accounting session time to zero. Uh, so just some clarification on this. Would, good as, as well if there's just some internal issues in the accounting here. Um, I think I'll go to the next. So this is a just some filter thresholds that our, our group came up with. Um, we're, we're basically just just you know here's just we have five filters we apply them to the to each session. Uh, these will the goal here is to detect uh, impossible or improbable conditions for the accounting. Um, this is how we would quote flag a, a session. Um, so, you know, of course we'll get, you know, interims and, you know, we'll get stop records. And this is all for mediated sessions. You know, what's the overall usage? Um, and, and, you know, we, we do have some, you know, Rick's uh, documents that tell us how to mediate sessions. You know, for example, if we don't receive a stop record, we take the latest interim. Um, you know, as you pointed out, you know, there's you know UDP packet loss. You know, we we, we do have ways to. You know, if we don't receive the stop record, we'll take the latest interim and we'll take the usage on that. But um, these the, all all of these apply to mediated sessions. Uh, so what we do is we'll apply these five filters, and this would basically just flag sessions on, uh, for unrealistic uh, um, conditions. You know, for example, the throughput, we just take that, we take the total bytes used, divide it by the session time. Uh, and we, in this case, you know, two gigabits per second, we're not, that's you know, impossible. Uh, our, our group are highly improbable over Wi-Fi. Uh, so we're, we're flagging that um, the exact giga word if the, uh, input and output gigawords are greater than zero, but octets are zero. That's another improbable one. Packet size, we decide this was a, uh, with jumbo frames, this was like an impossible um, packet size uh, session duration. You know, these, now these, the bottom two, they apply, they imply that the, the tonnage or the bytes used is greater than zero. You know, you, you can't have a zero session time with, uh, non-zero bytes used, and same thing with packets. You have to, if you have packets, you have to have data. So um, we we had those zero 
filters as well. Um, and just to kind of, just as the last slide, uh, I just wanted to just kind of show you what we've seen uh, through the vendor networks that, that we're, we're processing the traffic for, you know, how many, how, how wide spread is this? And, uh, you know, uh, and, and this is a, this, this is, this data set, this is just some data that, that I crunched and uh, from September 1st to September 14th, uh, just taking all accounting stop records, that's it. Uh, and um, so it's a, it's a very small amount of sessions. If you could see on the bottom, it's a very small amount. Um, the, uh, for example, the packet count, anything with packet count of zero. Um, well, let's just say velocity. Let's just say the velocity filter. Um, it's only 15.01% uh, uh, of our sessions actually reported a, a, a throughput of over two gigabits per second. So it wasn't that many, um, but the, uh, so just just relative to the overall number of sessions, but um, as you can see on our on the right side, uh, it's a significant amount of, of gigabytes. So this is so packet count um, sessions that reported a, a, a velocity of or a throughput of over two gigabits per second. Um, that actually was a total of twenty three uh, about twenty three terabytes. Um, that's the amount of data and sessions that reported over two gigabits per second. Um, and it's the same, same thing with, with these as well, with the others. Uh, it's just a, it's a significant amount. Um, and that's something we're, we're hoping to improve. Uh, we're hoping to fix where, you know, we're, we're trying to set up flags to, to, to find, find this, find session, find problematic sessions that, that could be, uh, reporting the usage wrong, um, and what are we doing about it? We we actually have a uh, we have some documents within as as I mentioned we, we have some documents that we're editing that are uh, read by other you know, members within the WBA, um, other clearinghouses, other hubs to um, do a kind of a dispute resolution like disputing usage and. Um, there, we're, we have like standardized processes that we're kind of modifying to just um, to address this. And you know, this you know these filters here will be the uh, will be in there as well um, um, in, in those documents. So others others involved in Wi-Fi roaming could look at them, and um, there would be a standardized definition for flagging sessions. So. Any feedback you have on on these filters, if there's something that doesn't make sense or something that um, were that we that you feel should be changed or edited or or, or added, um, let us know because we're we're working on a white paper to, to do this to to address this, um, and it will actually be finalized uh, next month. So. Um, that's all I have. Uh, that's that's it for the presentation. Um, I don't know if there's any questions or comments. Okay, well, that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you for for coming here, Ryan. Um, I don't know um, if if there is anything. Um, that you're allowed to or or would want to um, circulate to the mailing list about this, but uh, people are uh, often um, willing to like read things and comment on the mailing list if that would be would be helpful to you. Um, I don't know any. Does sure. anybody here have any comments or input for the WBA or Ryan or? Yeah, and uh, we like Alan joins our calls, and, and um, I, we definitely we're, we're we're in talks with him. Like he has a, a a document on on GitHub about issues and fixes, so we're we're working with him to uh, address some of these gray areas. Um, 
Bernard, I saw you join the queue and then leave. I don't know if you had something yeah. you wanted to say. Yeah, I, I just sent a message to the mailing list. I think um, maybe insecure practices might cover, might want to look at accounting issues too, because I think there's more than just authentication issues that probably should be considered insecure practices. Yes, this is Alan. Um, maybe from gathering all of these issues, it's, it's less insecure practices than what's wrong with the RFC. So for example, I had a discussion earlier this year with the vendor who shall remain unnamed that claimed that the accounting request packets could contain nothing in common with the access request packets. And reading 2866, they're right. Um, how you do accounting when you have no idea who's on your network, I don't know. But they were extremely proud of themselves to have discovered this loophole. And it somewhat annoyed their customers. Um, this is not really a insecure practices. This is a, oh God, the base protocol is broken. Um, and people are leveraging it to do crazy things. Well, not just crazy though, but potentially dishonest things. Yes. If you can't, yeah. if you can't audit, audit it, that's really bad. I would agree with adding this just personally. I would agree with adding things about this to insecure practices that would be like, for instance, you should never run this over UDP if anybody's paying anybody money related to it um, would be a perfectly fine thing, I think. I would rather not have insecure practices become a litany of everything that's wrong with the RFCs. Um, we have other ways of doing that. And if there's enough wrong with accounting that we need to reopen accounting in the IETF or in this working group, I think we should face that head on, not just make another document that says everything about this document over here is broken. Um, but, but I think it might be worth saying something about um, this, this be right, right now it's like, well, make sure your, you know, user it, information, your personally identifying information is run in an encrypted place. Make sure your passwords pass in an encrypted place. Make sure and and you know I think it'd be reasonable to say make sure any accounting information is passed in a secure sure way. You know? Yeah and it's it's probably worth I mean to Bernard's comment too it's probably worth putting at least a high level note in there saying your accounting data should be as good as you can make it. And if you're not sure about what the RFCs say, please talk to other people and do what everyone else does rather than inventing something completely ludicrous and shipping it in your product in the hands of people. Um, but past that, the, the wiki um, calls it issues and fixes too, I think. And yeah, for Margaret's point, whether we do yet another patch on top of a patch or slam our heads against the wall and, and try and wrap the base protocol. I, I don't want to talk about that right now. <laughs> it's a very sad thing to talk about. All right, well, thank you, everyone. And uh, that's it. I've closed the deck. OK, thank you, Ryan. Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sure that was the last thing on our agenda as well. Um, we got a bit longer slot than we asked for so we're running right at our requested one and a half hours but um if people have things it looks like alan has a thing uh they want to say before we go yeah um so to, to continue on the issues and fixes i believe we should finish the current documents first and get those out of the way so we can focus on whatever we want to do in the future but there are also issues um which are related to the IEEE. So one issue which has been raised recently is supplicants blasting radius servers with traffic. And if you send access rejects back quickly, the supplicant is immediately happy to send another packet. And now you have floods and who's responsible for fixing that. Um, you could delay rejects but uh, there may be some overlap with IEEE. I asked Bob Moskowitz the other day, um, he couldn't recall exactly what was in the original I IEEE 802.1x state machine, but there 
he didn't recall that there was any quenching in there. Um, and there's a, again, I, I put, put some of this up on the wiki. Um, there's, a, there's a litany of things which we could do to address this. Um, so there's, there's a whole bunch of open issues on the wiki about radius in general. Is it bugs or attacks? Uh, it, bugs. bugs. There, it's possible potentially for both, but the cases that we've captured have been things like mistyped realm names, um, certificates that have expired. I, you know, things you, a user who used to use Edgerome or someone who misconfigured Edgerome it can cause this. Uh, it's not the only operational problem that we have. Um, there is uh, congestion uh, in Edgerome. Um, not always caused by these kinds of floods, just caused by things like, um, you know, a very large homecoming game between two universities that are very close to each other uh, will cause congestion of one of our servers, whichever one uh, all that traffic gets load balanced to. Um, there are other cases where uh, there's congestion um, that basically causes you to start running out of server resources, um, you know, these aren't things that cause our, our system to go down, but they are things that cause our system to be servicing, you know, other people worse. And um, I think we need to talk about, I, I heard you mutter exponential back off over there under your computer. Um, we do need to talk about what things should be exponentially backing off. Um, it, how the timeouts work. Uh, there's currently like this funny thing that happens sometimes where if you've got multiple proxies in a row with a timeout set to the same thing for retransmission. Um, so they're one, two, three, and it's going to go to four is going to be the IDP. <clears throat> one sends to two, two sends to three, no answer. Three retransmit, two retransmit, one retransmits, like in that order. Um, and this is inefficient and causes congestion, Potent, you know, well, whatever order. <laughs> well, yeah, one sent it first, so one retransmits, then two, but yeah, but they all retransmit in sequence. And this causes, you know, a, a mul multiplicative traffic at a time when perhaps the reason the answer didn't come back was a little bit of congestion to begin with. And so we'll see charts where we get busy and slow and busy and slow over the course of a week. And then all of a sudden we get busy and then we exponentially get busier. And then things start to run out of um, resources. Maybe something crashes and then it, it comes back to normal. And those patterns are very familiar to me from TCP congestion charts. Uh, and we have just classic congestion caused by not, have, you know, every protocol that doesn't use TCP is doomed to repeat it. And uh, radius over UDP uh, hasn't repeated everything necessary to avoid uh, traffic ingestion. Uh, this is this is elegant. To address Michael's points, no, it's not an attack, but there's no reason it couldn't be. And in order to fix it, we will likely need to fix it in multiple places, at least including Radex and maybe the IEEE also, to go, hey, do quenching. If you're sending a thousand packets a second because of a broken supplicant, it's your fault. You need to fix it as as the switch authenticator, um, and and then for all the rest of it, I know there's been some discussion about an operational considerations document for Radius, which is not necessarily what's wrong with the protocol, but things which have been strenuously avoided since the beginning about things like failover, which was a subject of research in I believe 1994. And we've run away from since then. Well, one of the things that causes congestion is that if you're starting to get packet loss for any reason, you know, tricky UDP connection, a server that's overloaded, whatever, um, you'll start failing over. And failing over in the middle of an EAP session only guarantees that it fails. You could keep trying to go in the same way and maybe it would work. But if you're going to fail over an EAP session, you should actually just error out the EAP session. Um, because there's no point in failing over in the middle of an EAP session. You, you basically are guaranteeing that it fails, unless you've got a, like a routing thing that comes back around, which we generally don't have because we work really badly in mesh configurations versus tree configurations. So. Yeah, except proxies don't track EAP sessions, and if they could, blah, blah, blah. They're so <laughs> there, there, there is a lot of magic lore in various implementations which people have determined to work over time. It may not hurt to write some of this down. 
Um, I know for free radius, what we eventually figured out and decided and what seems to work with the least issues is we really don't care where those EAP sessions come from. So you can bounce EAP packets back and forth between three or four upstream servers. So long as that state attribute is there and matches an EAP session, it's perfectly fine. Um, as long as they end up at the same, same. end server, which they yes. don't have any, the, I mean, there's a lot of, a lot of trouble with the notion that we have a session layer on top of a protocol that thinks it's everything's one packet and and these are inherent problems but they're not unfixable problems potentially yeah, yeah. so it, it, it sounds like an operational considerations issue to me um, i know we had discussions many many years ago i thought they were uh, summarized in 5080 about who should transmit and why um, I know I had opinions about that at the time and Bernard had opinions, but I don't see any, I don't, can't find any results written down anywhere. Um, so maybe we need to open those discussions and write those conclusions down as operational considerations. Sorry. Hello, this is Kari from Radiator Software. One thing that supports of doing this kind of new operations document is all, also that, that if we are now kind of uh, replacing the UDP radius with the uh, radius over TLS and TCP, that the uh, kind of different things like retries, certificates, how they are validated, all these are uh, completely different about the UDP stuff because the radius over UDP did things differently. And now we have a TCP there ensuring, for example, the message getting through. So we need to kind of figure out the uh, recommended values, recommended settings, and that those things for this new radius 1.1 or uh, radius over TLS and so on. I agree. So anybody have anything else they want to, to bring up before we uh, call the meeting? Okay, thank you all. And uh, we'll see you again in uh, Brisbane in several months. Thank you. Will they have Edgerome there? Is that what you asked? I don't supply Edgerome for um, Australia, so I don't have the slightest clue. <laughs> <laughs> I well, I think first off, I personally can't supply Edgerome to people. But secondly, um, you know, they I think they do it at every IETF meeting, and, <laughs> and I think that they arrange with the local Edgerome people somehow. So maybe it would be Paul Decker's here, but uh, we know the people in Australia. They'll talk to them. The our nerd guys. <laughs> Uh, they, they have a new PKI certificate, and I think they're connected as a callback to uh, the ETLRs. And for everything else, uh, uh, I, I hope that they, they do dynamic discovery for everything that has a circuit or a DNS. I mean, if, if they're connected to the ETLR, then yeah. So they're, they're kind of their own natural. Probably. I mean, they, I think they, the sponsor for that is either Switch or um, Cascana. Yeah. yeah, I thought it was something Klotz had set up at some point. So. Yeah. I, I don't know. I don't so know. he may just have it going right back to Jack. I mean, I, I asked about Eduron for Vienna, and because they didn't have that there, uh, then they, they started to talk to people, and I offered to, to connect people, but they had a connection already. So. 
You don't need that determiner, right? We're good. Well, I mean, okay. you're going to get back to me about yes. IHD opinions on the, on, uh, the liaison yeah, statement. Yeah. 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 Okay, thank you. Obviously, they can see our discussions on the list, but I see no reason to ask people not to have it. No, no, I, no, no, no. Okay. Um, I don't know if we see each other again today. I don't know either. You can be a goodbye.